Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Innovation in Steel, Banquest Stadium. My name is Amanda, and I will be your host this afternoon. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Bluescope. Bluescope is a provider of innovative steel materials, products, systems and technologies headquartered in Australia with operations spread across North America, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands and throughout Asia. Bluescope is one of the world's leading manufacturers of painted and coated steel products and with strong expertise they provide vital components for houses, building structures and more. With more than 160 operations and sales offices across 18 countries, they employ over 14,000 people and serve thousands of customers every day, including engineers, architects and specifiers. The company's strong partnership and networks are built on Bluescope's most loved and recognised product brands, such as Colibond Steel, Zincaloon Steel, Galvespan Steel and Truecore Steel. Today we will hear from two speakers followed by our live audience Q&A session and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box during today's presentation. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Joseph Perello. Joe. With over 20 years experience as a professional structural engineer, Joe is the Building Structures Practice Leader for New South Wales and ACT at Oricon and has led the new design and refurbishment of some of the most complex, large-scale and iconic concrete and steel structures in Australia and abroad, across commercial, sporting, education and aviation. Joe led the structural design for the 360 million Banquest Stadium in Western Sydney, which has been delivering major economic benefits to the local community and beyond. Currently, Joe is leading the structural design for the 820 million Sydney Football Stadium redevelopment project, which will significantly boost cultural and sporting amenities in New South Wales once completed next year. Please welcome Joseph Perello. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for that introduction and welcome everyone here today. My name is Joseph Perello and I'm Oricon's Structural Practice Leader for New South Wales and ACT. I've been at Oricon for almost 21 years and I'm here today to talk to you about Bankwest Stadium and its innovative approach to steel design and construction. During my time at Oricon, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to work on some fantastic projects and my first ever stadium experience was being the site engineer for Wembley Stadium back in 2003 where I supervised the erection of the iconic arch. I've worked on several stadiums locally and around the world, and my current involvement includes leading the structure design of the Sydney Football Stadium, currently under construction. But I see Bank West Stadium as definitely one of my favourites, and throughout the presentation, you'll understand why. I love the kick that you get out of working on stadiums and the joy it brings to so many people at the sporting events. There's a real team approach and friendships are born from working closely with other members of the design team and there's always a challenge to be met. In order to put some context around the, the topic today, I'll firstly describe the stadium and Oricon's role before talking through the finer details. Bankway Stadium is an award-winning rectangular stadium located in Parramatta, roughly 25 kilometres west of the Sydney CBD. The stadium has a capacity of around 30,000 spectators, which increases to 40,000 spectators in concert mode. With a construction cost of around or just under 300 million, it's one of the most effect, cost effective stadiums built in Australia at under $10,000 a seat. It has an aggressive bowl layout with the steepest stands of any stadium of its kind in Australia at just under 34 degrees. 
and delivers an unrivaled game day experience. It's the first stadium in Australia that has seating that can be converted into safe standing positions. And this is really in response to some of those die-hard Western Sydney Wanderers fans who stand while watching the match. At the time of completion, it was the newest stadium in Sydney for the last 20 years. And it is actually the first stadium in the world to receive LEED version 4 gold certification by the US Green Building Council. This deal on the project was procured from Bluescope and was processed and fabricated locally uh, within around 20 kilometres of the site. Over $60 million in construction goods and services were procured from Western Sydney businesses and over 1,200 jobs were created during its construction with another six to 900 created uh, during its operation. And financially, it injects around $1 million into Parramatta's local economy at every major event. Oricon's role in the project included full structural, civil, ESD and wind engineering services. And we also provided a technical advisory role for MEP services such as uh, mechanical, electrical, fire, hydraulics. My role specifically was to lead the structural design and I also led the roof package design. Len Lease were the DNC contractor and the architecture was delivered by Populous. The project was funded by the New South Wales government and Venues New South Wales manages the stadium on behalf of the government while Venues Live New South Wales are the operator. Part of the project's success was definitely how Populous Oricon and Len Lease worked together so collaboratively, uh, especially during the, our time in the project office uh, during the design phase. The project was definitely very demanding, but very enjoyable and, and definitely rewarding at the same time. The project was announced in late 2015 by the New South Wales State Government, and Oricon bid the project in mid-2016 as part of Land Lease's uh, bid team. The project was awarded to Land Lease late in 2016, I think just before Christmas, and we were straight into the design office starting the design in January 2017. We had around 15 to 10 to 15 engineers, full, structural engineers working full time on the project, which peaked at around 20 at times. The construction started in late June 17 on site, and by October 2018, the roof had already been completed. The stadium was handed over uh, with its first match in April 2019. Bankwest Stadium replaces the previous Parramatta Stadium on the same site, which was originally built by Civil and Civic in 1985, after the old grandstand was burnt to the ground in 1981 by Parramatta fans, when Parramatta beat Newtown Jets to win their first ever Rugby League Premiership. So the ground has some controversy and definitely a long history of Rugby League that dates right back to 1909. The stadium contains just, uh, just under 30,000 square metres of roof area, which is roughly 30 metres above the pitch level. The north, south and east sides of the stadium contain the majority of the seats at 27,000, while the west side, which is the corporate side, contains a lot less at 3,000. The roof material is mainly PTFE, which is underslung from the roof steel, and the remaining 20% of the roof is covered with ETFE on the top side. And that's located within the first 10 metres from the leading edge of the roof, and that forms a halo around the entire leading edge. There is a roof gantry that's hidden above the PTFE and set back around 10 metres from, from the edge of the cantilevers, and that extends the entire roof to provide access to field lighting and speakers. And it also gives really easy access to inspect and maintain any roof steel structure. There's just uh, over 400, four and a half thousand tonnes of structural steel on the project. Two and a half thousand tonnes are in the roof, 1800 tonnes are in the bowl, and the rest of the steel uh, is made up in the smaller food and beverage and amenity structures that are scattered around the perimeter of the concourse. These were called pods and there was roughly 15 of them that were strategically placed around the concourse. The, the vast majority of the sections are uh, open steel sections being UCs, UCs or WCs or WBs.
This image here describes the typical framing for the north, south and east sides of the stadium. The roof is made up of a series of propped cantilevers around 48 metres in total length and around 6.5 metres deep centre to centre. The members in the roof trusses are typically 300 millimetre wide open sections and the upper tier or upper bowl as I've described it here is uh, made up of precast concrete plates spanning around 10 metres and are supported on hybrid portal and brace frame bowl structure. The bowl sections are a lot larger than the roof sections and are typically 500 WC columns and 1200 WB rakers. But the lower bowl is also constructed from precast plats but supported on precast concrete rakers instead. And this is the typical section through the western stand. You can see the truss shape is similar to the north, south and east. However, the grid spacing is slightly larger at just over 15 metres, which is 50% larger than the other three sides. Roof trusses, uh, the, the roof trusses here are typically 350 mil wide, slightly wider than the north, south and east due to a couple of reasons. One obvious one being the larger tributary width being 15% larger at, at 15 metres compared to the 10 metres in the north, south and east. And the other is that the west roof supports additional load from the 100 kilowatts of solar panels and associated maintenance access platforms that are placed there. And you can see that in the top right hand image where those uh, on the right hand side is the western side of the stadium and you can see those solar panels located there. The western stand is where all the corporate facilities are located. So whilst it has a similar roof system to the other three sides of the stadium, the stand itself is constructed from post-tensioned in-situ concrete. Um, all the stands on all four sides are supported by piles back down to rock. The project really started for us during the bid phase where we went through an iterative process with Populous, the architect, where they investigated different architectural forms. And here you can see some of the concepts that were presented uh, during the bid phase. And this is how we responded to some of those options. The structural forms range from cable stayed systems to a multitude of trussed, propped and cantilevered uh, roof systems. Although the bowl structure was pretty much a consistent approach of precast plats on steel rakers or in situ concrete in the case of the Western Stand. But it was during our design led innovation workshops and our tour of several stadiums up and down the eastern seaboard of Australia that our bid strategy really began to take shape. And it really boiled down to these challenges and how we were able to respond to them. There were many ways to dis dissect when I, when I think about in, in hindsight um, the different parts of the project, but speed always formed part of the outcome. Now, being able to achieve speed across any one of these three challenges can be relatively easy, but the real challenge is being able to succeed at all three throughout the design and construction process and incorporate speed into all three of them. And through my presentation, I'll explain how we were able to do this. From the outset, we knew that if we designed and documented the project in a traditional way, there would be inherent differences between our model, the architectural model and the shop drawing model. This would slow us down having to resolve clashes continually and answering shop drawings that occurred well f uh, further down in the design and, and documentation process. So we turned the traditional process on its head and found an innovative solution by working alongside the shop drawers engaged by Lendlease from day one on the project. And we literally sat next to them side by side uh, with the shop drawing modelers and we designed and documented the stadium together. We did this firstly by importing our analysis models into their Tecla model. And Tecla model is, is the platform for which shop drawings are produced or the model is produced. Then we worked through the connection detailing with them on the spot and solved all the fabrication and billability issues simultaneously with Lendlease. And these are usually discovered much later in the design process and shop drawing reviews, causing a lot of rework. We consistently exported the Tecla model back into uh, Revit 
and used Revit to coordinate with the rest of the design team as part of a larger federated model. As the other consultants were all using Revit and Tecla wasn't a compatible platform for them. This really simplified and sped up our documentation as we use the Tecla model as the basis for our structural model and we annotated the engineering information on our drawings. This allowed us to, to concentrate on other areas of the design that Lendless really needed our attention on. Ultimately, this documentation process allowed Lendless to generate a single source of truth, overcoming many of the hurdles faced on previous projects. This is now a project that Oric uh, sorry, this is now a process that Oricon undertakes on some of our current projects uh, using our in-house capability to produce shop drawing ready models, saving significant periods of time in the overall design and construction program. The roof connections shown here on, on this image illustrate how the use of Tecla uh, through the colored images were incorporated as part of our documentation and then we use those images and information to then, as I mentioned, annotate and, and detail the connections. This also meant there was real-time coordination of all, all the details, but especially the trickier ones as the connection shown here. This would normally take weeks or even a month to coordinate properly, but Thing, items like this and detailed connections like this were resolved in days. We also collaborated with the shop drawers to modify the numbering convention system of the shop drawings to allow us to manip manipulate the shop drawing data and speed up our review. We added prefixes to all the shop drawings to suit how we were reviewing the drawings. And that made the shop drawing approval uh, extremely fast with up to a thousand drawings turned around in as little as a few days. It actually took longer to download and upload our review drawings than what it did to actually review the drawings themselves. Within 10 weeks of starting the project, Lendlease had already placed their first steel bulk order. And that, those bulk order shop drawings were issued and returned on the same day. And on that day also, we issued our structural drawings. So to have the structural drawings issued, the bulk order shop drawings issued and returned all on the same day uh, is usually unheard of. The flow chart on the uh, left here uh, explains the, um, the, the differences between the traditional and our uh, documentation approach. You can see traditionally that we would produce our design and then we would uh, undertake Revit modeling or we would model it and produce our drawings. It would then move on to, um, to be uh, used in Tecla by a shop drawer and that process would involve the builder engaging a fabricator, the fabricator engaging a shop drawer. Um, they would then produce shop drawings. They would ask con continual RFIs during the process and then we would review them. And if there was any drawings that needed to be revised and resubmitted, we'd go through an iterative process. And that sometimes can take up to three or four revisions of drawings, depending on how that's communicated. Whereas on this project, it was a lot different. And we, able to, we were able to truncate that process and that program. So the design was undertaken simultaneously with the uh, shop drawers who, from that point there, we were able to produce shop drawings that were a lot more streamlined and the approval process was a lot faster. And uh, when you think about it um, as an from an engineering perspective, when you have modelers undertaking your documentation and you're reviewing them on a daily basis, you have trust in the model you're producing. This is what we had with the shop drawers. We were sitting next to them. We, we were reviewing our, the shop, technically we were doing the shop drawings on a day-to-day -day basis. Every time we looked at the model with them, we were reviewing the drawings, we were reviewing the model. And that's how we were able to really understand what was in the model so thoroughly and it made the shop drawing process approval so much faster. And ultimately, I think this saved at least two months off the program. So it was a significant saving. We agreed as a team at the start of the project that to have a successful procurement strategy, we needed to utilize locally available materials and profiles 
that we could procure early. And our way of achieving that was to use open sections procured from Bluescope. But with our bowl and roof truss system agreed during the bid phase, we knew that using open sections weren't as efficient as closed sections. So we needed to maximise automated fabrication techniques and minimise the manual labour to achieve lower fabrication costs and cost rates to offset the relatively heavier sections. This is when we knew we needed to maximise the use of beamline machinery in our approach to our member and connection design. This image here is shown on the screen um, is from Southern Steel's Milpera factory where one of the roof columns has been delivered from Bluescope and is ready to be processed on the beamline machine where basically it was automatically cut to length and holes drilled uh, soon after being delivered. Our best hope of maximising the automated fabrication in the design was to utilise the use of bolted sections and flange plate connections were an opportunity for us to achieve this, eliminating the vast majority of welding requirements, especially on the main member lengths themselves. We agreed on a set of fabrication rules with Lenlease that were the basis of our design, and they were centered around you know, minimizing any work to the main member shafts to just cutting the member length and drilling holes. We replaced any welded connection with a bolted one where possible, even if it meant a slightly heavier connection. We located splices to minimize wastage in member lengths. And where we where possible, we kept um, uh, the intersecting members orthogonal in at least two dimensions to suit the, the axis of symmetry around open sections. If welding was required, we separated the welded element from the main member shaft. And we even replaced welded gussets with bolted alternatives where we could. The images you see here describe how some of the connections were quite complex and show the lengths that we went to to achieve these rules. The image on the left is an example of part of a raker beam and the stools that are required to support the precast plates that you see on top. You can see three of these stools on top of the raker. You can clearly see that to keep the processing of the main beam clean, we bolted the stools to the beam rather than welding. In the image on the right, this is an example of how we replace welded elements on the main cord with a bolted substitute. On the main truss cord, you see running from left to right on the screen, you will see that um, the stiffener plates between the two flanges weren't actually welded in place but were bolted in place with end plates. In both examples, every other stadium would norm normally weld these in place, but by separating them from the main member shaft, it kept the main members free of manual fabrication and kept their processing as automated as possible. This also allows the fabrication cost rate of the larger sections to be kept relatively low because there was no manual fabrication required on the shaft itself and not compromised by a relatively small welded connection. And at a cost per tonne, a small increase in the rate on those larger sections makes a large difference to the overall cost when large volumes are considered. Separating the smaller elements also allows the stools and stiffener plates to be fabricated by a different fabricator who might be better suited to this type of fabrication rather than the processing of the larger sections. So that, that allows a greater economies during the, the fabrication process. And generally that's how our beamline strategy really took shape on the project. But the idea of using um, bolted open sections on the cantilever roof trusses posed a challenge that we really needed to solve to make it successful. Traditionally, the web members of the trusses are smaller section sizes than the top and bottom cords. And this is because uh, generally um, the forces seen in uh, the webs are a lot less than the tension and compression seen in the, in the cantilevers, uh, top and bottom cords. So as a result, we either needed to 
use unnecessarily large web members to align the outer face of the flanges of, uh, with the cords um, to make flange plates work, which was going to significantly increase the steel weight or use a smaller section and then use packer plates to align the outside dimension of the flanges, which would really complicate and slow down the installation and compromise durability on the project. I remember the conversation I had with Patrick Bashar from Len Lease and I said, the only way to, to make this work is to use custom fabricated sections to match the flange widths. Um, and soon after that conversation, um, in the following weeks, Pat had advised that he was able to secure custom sections and which saved us either hundreds of tons of steel or a few thousand packer plates. So in the end, the roof steel was made up of a combination of off-the-shelf UC and WC sections, so universal column and welded column sections, and custom open sections. We were able to adjust the dimensions of this custom sections to align the flanges, but at the same time, we were able to reduce the flange and web thicknesses to save on tonnage. This image that you see here on the top of the screen uh, is the typical roof truss. And the solid colours represent the custom sections that we were able to adjust in size to match uh, the other colours that are shaded, shown lightly shaded, to achieve our overall economy. And you can see here that the custom sections did make up a large proportion of the overall steel weight. The table here as well shows uh, the custom sizes that we produced on the project that were uniquely sized to um, suit the dimensions of the off-the-shelf open section sizes, so your 250s, your 300s, your 350s. So as a result of our design, documentation and fabrication approach, Lean Lease was able to place their first steel bulk order of the bowl in less than three months after our first day in the office, with the roof steel bulk order starting within five months. Now these timeframes were really unheard of in the market and were a credit to Lend Lease and the project team. The set of images you see here describe the process from mill to site and how streamlined the process was. So starting at the top left, uh, an open section was delivered from Blue Scope Steel to Southern Steel and Southerns was able to then Beamline process that member in the photo at the top in the middle where uh, the section was cut to length and holes automatically drilled. The top right photo shows that member was ready for, for painting. So one of the initiatives that Lendlease also undertook was that their fabricators that were engaged also had painting facilities in their workshops. So that also saved two stages of transport to and from um, painting yards. So the bottom left photo you can see is uh, one of the elements that's been painted in. And as you look down that shaft, you can see nothing uh, but paint except for the end of the member, which has bolt, uh, bolt holes in place. So a relatively simple, a uh, clean section that was easily processed at speed. The bottom middle photo shows that uh, where plates were required that they were plasma cut and nested in overall sheets to maximize efficiency. And the bottom right shows how simple it was to, to place these sections and uh, straight into place on site. And it would be remiss of me not to give a shout out to Al Baxter and the fantastic team at Populous who really bought in on these design challenges and initiatives. It was uh, our collaboration with Populous and their mindset that meant whilst we had the structural freedom on the roof and bowl to design the structure to achieve the economies we required, Populous was still able to create a sleek and elegant roof line through the use of an underslung fabric. And where this steel was visibly prominent, such as the concourse entries as shown here, Populous found a way to really celebrate the steelwork and work closely with Oricon to provide input to the connection design by coordinating the visual impact of the members, 
connection plates and bolting arrangements all within of our fabrication and construction rules that we, we had agreed with Lendlease. From the outset, we knew that we had to provide Lendlease with a design that enabled their installation methodology to maximise safety by allowing as much installation on the ground as possible, not require any welding, eliminate the need for temporary works and have the flexibility to allow the construction sequence to change without requiring any changes to the design. The first thing we did is really understand their in install sequence. So Lendlease's approach was to, to pre-assemble all the cantilever trusses on the ground and lift them into position, minimising lifts and maximising speed and safety. Then they would attach the infill trusses in pieces between the pre-assembled bays. This pre-assembly plan shows all 56 roof trusses uh, being fully assembled on the ground prior to lifting. So this image is another way of describing the pre-assembled bays that were lifted into position firstly. And this is the image of the infill trusses and the elements that were lifted into place sequentially after the pre-assembled bays. So when we designed our lateral bracing system, we made sure to locate our bracing in the pre-assembled bays to ensure the stability of the elements during the lift and to negate the need for any temporary works. Here you can see the third pre-assembled bay being lifted into position by the crane on the left, but you can also see the crane on the right installing one of the infill trusses which connects the two adjacent pre-assembled bays. When it came to assembly on site, the implementation of our earlier strategies around bolted connections and modular design that Lendlease were able to assemble and lift up to two bays a week. On the day of the lift, they started quite early, um, but the trusses were usually lifted and bolted in place and off the hook by morning tea. So that was a great achievement. The two images on the left show some pre-assembled bays ready for lifting. And the image on the right also illustrates how the field lighting was installed on the gantry structure prior to lifting, which also minimised working from heights and maximised safety. One of the benefits of using steel is its potential for reuse. But the problem with many steel structures that are welded in place is the amount of demolition required to salvage the steel which is too great for the steel reuse to be economically viable. The beauty of the steel structure in this stadium is that at any point in time in the future, how easily the roof can be disassembled and reassembled at another site without any destructive means whatsoever. All of the steel can be simply unbolted along with the precast plats. These images show how easy it would be to dismantle and relocate the roof and bowl structure. Furthermore, if the need arose, the steel could be used for not just a relocated stadium. The method of design and the fact that members were relatively free of welded cleats and welded collect, uh, connections mean that the members could be easily reused for another structure. There is literally kilometres of clean sections that could be used to design multiple steel buildings. And the section sizes are very similar to what you'd use. So you've got as I mentioned earlier, 250 UCs, 300, 310 UCs, 350 WCs. You got some larger columns in there at 500 WCs and some, some large beams at 1200 WB. So they're all uh, generally typical sizes, uh, most of them. Um, they could be easily reused. As an engineer, there's always a, the QA documentation that is required as part of our certification. And in this instance, if the steel and precast concrete is ever reused, you would have to go through that process again. But Lendlease have, gen have generated full traceability across every element down to individually assemble numbers, assembly numbers. So for every piece of uh, roof steel or, or precast concrete, all of its QA, such as fabrication IT, ITPs, world records, 
paint certifications and mill certificates can be sourced and traced. So that really, that is a fantastic outcome in terms of being able to reuse this stadium uh, for a lot longer than its design life for many years to come. So I hope you've enjoyed my presentation today on Bankwest Stadium and its innovative, innovative use of uh, steel in its, in its design and construction. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, once Richard and Spiros have presented today. So thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for your insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Richard Yarrett. Richard is the Senior Construction Manager at Lendlease with experience in retail developments, educational facilities, sporting and entertainment precincts and health infrastructure. Richard strives to successfully project manage and deliver construction developments, drawing on the experience from abroad and here in Australia. Please welcome Richard Yarrett. Thanks, Amanda, for that introduction. Good afternoon, all. And thank you for taking the time to listen to a presentation on the construction of Bankwest Stadium. I'll provide a project overview, insight into the design, procurement, construction methodology, construction challenges and innovations. Project overview. So Bankwest Stadium is one of the most important pieces of social and sporting infrastructure in New South Wales. This world-class 30,000 seat rectangular stadium in Parramatta is a be beautiful synthesis of engineering and design, linking the community to social infrastructure in the surrounding historic park precinct and has redefined the live event experience. Lendlease was contracted by the New South Wales government to design and construct the sporting venue within a two and a half year time frame. The win strategy was to provide a venue that would change the way sport is watched live. Providing the steepest stands in Australia, bringing the fans closer to the action than ever before, and giving the best sight lines in Australia to view sport. Introducing advanced audio visual technology, 100% spectator roof coverage, and under pitch heating and cooling systems. I've highlighted on the construction program how critical the design and procurement of structural steel was to the successful completion of the stadium. From contract award in December 2016, the design team were able to progress design at a rapid pace to enable fabrication of steelwork by April 2017. Steel installation commenced on site in October 17 to the bowl with the stadium roof installation kicking off from, from December 17. The roof was completed by October 2018, which allowed three months to complete the pitch works and handover to venues New South Wales, ready for the first sellout event of the Eels vs Tigers. Sadly, the Tigers went down at that game. Moving on to design. Lendlease and its delivery partners developed a design strategy centred around strong collaboration, which worked towards one single solution and achieved the client's aspirations for speed in its design and construction, while being a world-class spectator-focused locally sourced stadium. Lendlease worked closely with Oricon, Populous and Aspect Studios to shape a stadium design that was quick to manufacture, easy to assemble, cost-effective and architecturally impressive. An exemplary strategy was to co-locate the design team into one project office, which provided strong working relationships and collaboration amongst the architects, engineers, shop details and construction team. The time saving in RFIs, meetings and emails was a first of a kind and it was a key to the success of ensuring fabrication of steel work commencing within four months of contract award. In the first critical months, digital specialists successfully linked the structural, architectural and shop modelling platforms together. This was made possible by the hard work up front and the collaborative approach. The design team, working closely with the Lendlease construction team, strategised over material selection and programme constraints to shape the stadium. First and foremost was the time frame that was set to deliver this unique project. The success was going to be the supply of material and efficient construction processes. This drove the structural engineers to adopt bolted flange plate connections and open sections in our structural design to enable the automated beamline approach to steelwork fabrication, 
reducing manual labour and maximising constructability by producing structural members ready for delivery and installation on site. This led to minimal site works being required with almost no site welding needed for the entire stadium build, reducing construction time and improving the quality of the paint finish. These solutions ultimately sped up the overall construction program, reduced risk and enabled steel to be sourced from Western Sydney, providing local employment and truly building a stadium by the people for the people. The use of precast for the stadium seating plats allowed for an integral shop detailing process and further off-site manufacture. Part of the Lindley strategy was to design the steel structure with minimal temporary works. With enhanced engineering up front, this was successfully achieved, reducing the risk to workers on site and leading to a faster and, a, and more affordable build. The design of the stadium steel and precast was defined as the upper and lower bowl. The upper bowl consisted of steel rakers spanning off the concrete concourse slab designed to take the load of the precast concrete plats and roof trusses. These rakers were bolted in place on site, allowing for an efficient streamlined process. This consisted of approximately 1,800 ton, tonnes of steel throughout. The lower bowl of the stadium was constructed of precast concrete rakers and precast concrete plats. Independent of the upper bowl, this lower section was constructed following the roof truss installation. Diversifying material selection enabled procurement early on for precast elements. Procurement. The New South Wales government mandated the requirement for Bankwest Stadium to be part of Western Sydney with local manufacture and construction companies. Lenley saw this as an opportunity to invest in our local community. This gave rise to major economic benefits, ensuring a lasting legacy. The construction procurement saw 1,200 plus jobs during construction, millions of dollars injected into the local economy, and 600 to 900 jobs created during operation of the stadium. Early procurement was necessary to meet the construction program. Forming partnerships during the bid phase with services contractors allowed for early design and procurement. Material selection of the delivery confidence and reduce the risk. Large volume of materials like steelwork and precasted precast required strategic sourcing to ensure program and quality requirements to be achieved. In order to overcome the risk of steel supply, Lendlease reached out to Blue Scope and Southern Steel as a main supplier and process of structural steel. Using Australia steel was a must. To fabricate the 4,600 tonnes of steel in the short time frame required, required multiple fabricators to be contracted. Lendlease developed a procurement model which allowed for control of supply, quality and delivery. A dedicated team of structural steel engineers and commercial managers work closely together to set up a framework where multiple steel fabricators were engaged to all play a contributing role in the fabrication process. Parcels of steel work was packaged up to local fabricators to fabricate and paint steel work in accordance with their workshop capabilities and our overall construction program. This enabled the segregation of works and ensured timely timely delivery of materials to the site when required. A unique quality control system was developed to track the entire process from processing to fabrication, painting, delivery and installation. Lendlease engaged steel riggers to assemble and install the works, utilising plant and equipment specifically selected for the type and size of lifts. Construction methodology. Lendlease took possession of the existing Parramatta Stadium in January 2017. This allowed the commencement of the demolition of the old Pertec Stadium. Demolition works were completed in May 17. With the use of large excavators with hammers and steel cutting attachments, the stadium was safely demolished. Temporary works engineering was undertaken to safely demolish the existing steel roof. A concrete crusher was mobilised on site which allowed Lendlease to crush all the concrete from the existing site, which was reused in the new construction of Bankwest Stadium. Three months of civil and remediation works were undertaken to reshape the 90,000 cubic metres of spoil around the site. Piling works commenced in July 17 and were completed in September 17. Over 450 piles were driven into the ground with a mixture of board piles and CFA piles. 
The new build of the stadium had to be delivered in record time. At concept design, the right decision was made to split the stadium into two forms to drive procurement and construction efficiencies. The Western Grandstand was designed as a conventional concrete frame, whilst the other three elevations of the stadium were designed as a steel and precast structure. This allowed two forms of construction methodology, reducing risk in procurement, lead times, and specialised construction trades. The Western Grandstand was built conventionally with suspended formwork, post-tensioned and steel reinforced concrete slabs. The structure was protected with scaffold and one hammerhead tower crane provided materials handling throughout. The facade of the Western Grandstand is made up of various materials, including equitone, clip lock and glazing. With local resources, the concrete structure was efficiently constructed with multiple work crews independently of the remaining grandstand works. This was a key benefit to the speed of the overall construction. The south, east and north was constructed with the use of, cr of crawler cranes positioned within the pitch. Detailed logistics and planning was required to ensure the safe assembly and installation of over the 4,600 tonnes of steelwork. Once the concourse slab was poured, the prefabricated bowl steelwork was delivered from sem several steel fabricators and assembled on site. Once sufficient bowl steel was installed and braced, precast concrete plats were delivered and lifted into place. This was an efficient method of building the raked seating frame. Semi-trailers of steelwork and precast were continually en route to the site, which required careful planning by site management. By January 2018, pre-assembly of the roof portals were underway, being assembled in the pitch. The roof consisted of 56 bays. 28 were prefabricated on the pitch, pitch, each weighing approximately 70 tonnes. This assembly work on the pitch significantly reduced the works at heights for the riggers. A production line was set up on the pitch with two assembly bays occurring at a time. The allocation of steel riggers at this time was critical. Work fronts for steel work, work, fronts for steel work included completing raker bowl steel, pre-assembling the roof trusses, and infilling roof sections between the pre-assembled roof bays. There were over 30 steel riggers on site during this process. Daily deliveries of steel work was required to meet the assembly time, aiding the need for a unique QA tracker system of production and delivery. The 400 tonne crawler crane would lift the 70 tonne roof truss into position and would be bolted off by riggers in boom lifts. The typical roof sequence was to install every second pre-assembled roof truss, followed by infilling the roof bay between. This is indicated in the model shown. Both procurement and assembly followed the se this sequence to ensure the correct steel was used in the correct locations. The video here that you're able to watch was the first successful pre-assembled braced roof truss lifted into position. This was an exciting day for the engineers and construction team to get together on site and watch this magnificent work come to, come to play. It generally took three to four hours to lift a truss um, from the ground into position and bolt it off. Once the roof still had progressed, the PTFE roof fabric was deployed at each bay by the use of boom lifts. The main PTFE fabric is underslung off the steelwork to give clean lines from below while simultaneously hiding the supporting steelwork. The ETFE around the leading edge of the roof was specifically selected to allow UV light to pass through and assist in the growth of the pitch below, whilst offering full cover, cover, coverage from rain. At the completion of all elevated works from the pitch, the pitch construction was able to commence. This was a three month process constructing the in-ground heating and cooling system and subgrade preparation. The reinforced turf system had been grown off site and was transported to site and rolled out in seven days. Challenges and innovations. Exposure to the weather was a key construction challenge. With such a large building with many open areas, the risk of wet weather and wind was always a challenge. To overcome this risk, Lendlease looked to as much off-site manufacture where possible. Precast and steel work off-site manufacture minimised significant labour on site. 
Fit out and joinery prefabrication opportunities were sourced with further offsite production increasing uh, to provide more efficiency during the fit out stage of the project. Designing a one tier approach was a great outcome, which enabled more efficiencies in steel and precast installation. Structural design enabled an automated beamline approach to steelwork fabrication. The steel detailing process adopting the shop, for, shop draw first strategy, which cut the shop detailing process in half, was a further innovation for this project. Elimination of truck movements off site by reusing material on site during the remediation and demolition phase of the project minimised our footprint on the local community. Innovative steel design, which allowed to reduce work at height by assembling steel work on the ground, reduced the risk of workers um, at height. And finally, utilising structural steel members, which can be disassembled in the future and reused for other construction purposes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you to our great speakers, um, Joseph and Richard. Um, it's now your turn to get involved. Our speakers will now come together to take questions from you. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, please do so via the chat box. And if you could also put your name and who the question is for, that would be great. I'd also like to welcome Spiris Dallas, who will be joining us for the Q&A session. Spiris is a National Engineering Manager with Bluescope. His current role has a focus on efficient steel framed project delivery in multi-stallary buildings and infrastructure projects. He has extensive experience in considering designs at early stage and providing steel solutions, substantially reducing costs for the construction. Ferris holds a Bachelor of Structural Engineering degree and has held a number of advisory and industry roles in the steel construction arena for over 30 years. So without further ado, and thank you to everyone who sent through some questions on registration. And we'll begin with one of those um, direct to you, Joseph, um, which has come in from Michael. And Michael is in Queensland. Good afternoon, Michael, asking, what solutions were used to minimise crowd vibration effects? Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, we used um, a couple of different methods, but um, I think we took guidance uh, to start with from the client brief that was set by I New South Wales. And there was some specific references to uh, the 80th minute ritual, um, which is where, um, say for example in the western sydney wanderers at the 80th minute um the, the spectators turn away from uh the field and so um the, the brief itself specified that and then we had to meet those requirements and it also gave guidance on which documents to use and uh to at least um meet um the the, the detailed requirements set out in those publications and one of them was the i struct e document uh, produced um, I think when we uh, think about the vibration in particular, we know that both in the bowl itself, especially the upper bowl, uh, the, the requirements were very strict. And it, it is one of the only stadiums in Australia that actually meets the, the, the most stringent criteria for, for, for vibration um, set out in the iStruct E document. Thanks for the steel rated. Oh. Thank you. Okay? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we've had a question come in from Linda um, asking both to maybe starting with you, Richard, and then on to Joe. Uh, Linda's in WA, so still good morning in WA, asking Is the design all compliant to AS or ISO standards? Richard. Oh, Joe, do you want to kick off? No, Richard. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Amanda. Um, so, yeah, the governing document for compliance um, really is is from the project brief, um, which was issued by the New South Wales government. And within this brief um, is reference to the green guide. Um, the green guide um, is used by um, architects and designers around the world uh, to design stadiums. Um, and this provides technical specifications on key areas of the build, 
um, such as calculating the safe capacity of sports grounds, management responsibility for planning, um, circulation space, uh, seating accommodation, standing accommodation, food and beverage provisions, and other key uh, mechanical and other services provisions. Um, so that's probably the main compliance document uh, we, we work to along with obviously your relevant Australian standards for concrete and steel. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, Joe, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, look, I think that um, it, the the brief sets out very clearly what we what we needed to do um, in terms of all ISO and uh, AS standards. There's also reference in the client brief to use British standards or American standards as well if uh, the Australian or ISO standards didn't relate to them specifically. Thanks for that. We've had a great question staying in WA from Johan, who is asking, and very topical as we look towards the Brisbane Olympics. And Johan is asking, uh, you, Joe, uh, learning from dead stadiums and unused infrastructure after Olympics, uh, what's your sustainable plan? Thanks, Johan. That's a, that's a good question. I think, um, firstly, you need to consider um, some of those stadiums that have been built specifically for the Olympics and and bank west so the models are very different and there probably wasn't a long-term strategy behind uh the, the the ongoing investment of of that of that stadium you know if you look at some of the stadiums in china that are now run down um, the difference with bank west is that um the ongoing investment model is uh is a private investment so venues venues live is a private entity so in order to maintain that um, asset, it has to be commercially viable, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But you know, if you think about um, how we might have considered um, incorporating a long-term investment and activation in the stadium, um, there's there's things that were undertaken via populace through you know being very flexible in the function spaces, um, outdoor activations with uh, the basketball courts and the cafes that are on site. But, but venues live really have, have gone further than that. If you look at some of the activities and the activation that um, is undertaken on the site, you'll see that it's not just um, sporting events, you know, festivals, um, uh, you know, even down to parking that's been used in the area. So, um, you know, there's been drive-in movie nights, there's been Pixar, Putt-Putt, all kinds of things that extend well beyond. Any function room can be hired there. So anywhere between two and 30,000 people can and hire the stadium. So um, from breakfast, lunch and dinner. So it's a very, it's a very broad um, base that they provide. They even provided um, meals for over 500 rooms during COVID through their kitchen facility. So it isn't necessarily their core business, but you find that there's an operating model there that's driven by private investment and that really keeps the, the, the economic viability of the stadium running. Thanks, Joe. Um, and often at uh, Thought Leaders series events, we talk about you know taking a whole of life approach, and and we've had a staying with you, Joe, for now. We've had a great question from Christopher, who is in Tasmania. Good afternoon, asking what consideration is taken regarding coatings and service life. Thank you. The the client brief was very specific around. Uh, the design life of the structure and specifically the need to minimise maintenance during the life of um, structure, especially around the steelwork. But um, so in place at the moment, there is there is a long term warranty that's been provided by the manufacturer and that manufacturer was involved during uh, the coding process. So they're, they've bought into the process, they're aware of how it's been produced and when it comes to delivery on site, they they are in agreement with how it was delivered. And there's yearly maintenance inspections in place to ensure that that, that warranty is maintained uh, throughout the life of the structure. But I think I, I should also touch on something else where, which is raised in this topic, and that is the fact that we have an underslung um, fabric means that the access to the steelwork is so much easier than the majority of any other stadium in Australia. We found during our tour of those other stadiums that um, 
they took up to three years to determine how to actually maintain their steelwork. And there was considerable cost involved um, in nearing a million dollars to be able to maintain their structure. So having the underslung fabric across the majority of the steelwork meant that not only was um, the natural rain event um, able to wash off any salt that might have built up on the members, but access to those members was was extremely easy. And that PTFE fabric can be walked on and accessed to get to the majority of the steel. So that's a real benefit to the to the steel work and to the project that um, a lot of other projects and stadiums don't have. Thanks, Joe. And I just want to bring Spiros now into our conversation this afternoon. Um, Joe, you touched on the coatings manufacturer, but Blue Scope is a steel manufacturer. Spiros, how does Blue Scope provide value to these types of projects? Big question. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, we, we heard um, from the two speakers, uh, collaboration ha has been um, highly used and, and it works perfectly. And um, that's the sort of thing we're asking as well. Engage with the actual Blue Scope um, uh, structural engineers uh, early in the piece. And, um, and because, uh, because we work closely with the meal and understanding, knowing the, um, the mill capability and its limitations outside the standard range, um, we're able to assist in the um, uh, the design phase with the project team. Um, and it was mentioned earlier uh, from Joe as well, um, how we can actually do a, a, a custom member uh, suited uh, a certain connection detail a lot better than the standard sections or um, uh, in terms of depth, uh, ge geometry um, and so on. Um, and another way would be like, um, uh, say, for um, a project that's got a lot of repetition members and it's a, a, a lot of a strength governing uh, situations. Uh, it may be that a, a, a higher grade or a non-standard grade, higher grade, might actually suit and saving um, mass um, and um, also assisting with the constructability by being a lighter uh, structure as well. So. Um, the, the best uh, yeah, scenario really is to um, um, get, get Bluescope involved so um, we can work with the meal and uh, come up with the most efficient sections. Um, and then um, it, when you have the efficient section um, already uh, designed um, and supplied uh, by the meal, it uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. easily then the next step is to go through the distribution beam lines and be cut and drilled and the whole process will be a, a lot a, a simpler and uh, more uh, economical. So um, yeah, get in touch with us. Thanks, Spiros. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a fa fabulous question that's come in and Bankwest is a, is a relatively young stadium that as engineers we're continually innovating and question to you Richard is if you were to build the stadium again what would you do differently? Thank you. Thanks Amanda. Um, well yeah good question. Um, I guess um, the things that we learned the most was about the the speed of construction. Um, you know you, you hear that stadiums generally go over time and um, when we delivered Bank West we delivered on time. Um, so it's always about looking at opportunities to, to, to maximize um, productivity and ensure safety. Um, one thing um, if I was going to do another stadium would be looking to make sure we maximize the amount of time we have to build the roof. The roof is obviously the most complex part of the stadium. Um, so ensuring you have a methodology that allows you to fabricate that roof um, as early as possible in your program. So, you know, access and egress into the pitch uh, through a tunnel system um, or something similar like that for materials handling, um, early construction uh, to enable more time um, to build the roof, I think is key. Um, another thing I would like to, uh, if I have my time again, is, you know, with the design, I think we did it exceptionally well at Bank West with the amount of uh, facilities around the stadium, uh, because obviously game days are mostly on weekends. So um, being able to activate the precinct Monday to Friday would be key. Um, and we have done that successfully at Bank West. Um, so, you know, introducing other key um, avenues for entertainment at a sporting precinct, I think is uh, key. Thanks, Thanks, Richard. Thank you. And we talked about the, the bowl being uh, the innovation of being manufactured from steel, but we've had a question to you, Richard, again, 
Um, how much precast was manufactured for the stadium? Uh, kilometres. We had kilometres of precast. So um, within the upper bowl, uh, there was over 12 kilometres of precast um, manufactured um, over um, about 1,300 units um, of, of plats. Um, and in the, in the lower bowl, there was another uh, three and a half kilometres worth of precast. So, you know, um, the amount of um, off-site manufacture, the, the lead time um, to start that production line to to, to manufacture and, and, and have the materials in time for delivery took considerable planning and programming and off-site inspections. Um, then obviously the logistics, the deliveries in and out of the site of uh, precast plats, you know, up to 12 metres long in length, um, you know, the volume of, of transport required to, to, to the precast to the stadium uh, was, was quite a logistical challenge, uh, but managed very well by the team. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Um, over to you, Joe. We've had a question come in um, from Ho Young in New South Wales asking, how do you consider the differential movement of footings for the state stadium? Thank you. Uh, usually the differential movement of the footings uh, is specified as part of a client brief, but generally there's recommended standards. So we have a limit on which um, each adjacent footing or pile in this instance could deflect more than the adjacent one and we do that through a few methods so what we, we start with the pole design and we set requirements in the brief around uh, those movements and the piles are sized accordingly to make sure there isn't that much deflection but even with the deflection that's allowable and the differential movement um, we then consider that as part of our design and we are able to impose displacements within our analysis models to mimic that movement and then that those forces that are generated because of those movements is then uh, incorporated as a loading scenario into our design. Thanks Joe. and just staying with you Richard talked a little bit about the roof um, and wanting to have had more time. Um, we've had a question, was there any unusual loading requirements you encountered in the roof design? Thanks, Joe. I think um, one of the ones that was really interesting was uh, hail loading on the roof. Now, it wasn't specifically uh, defined within the brief, but it's something that we know, especially in Western Sydney in past years, where there's been failures of, of um, large um, sheds in in western sydney because of the hail effects so we we worked, we worked really closely to define that solution so um, especially even in the hydraulics codes they they talk about need to address hail but there isn't anything specific to tell you uh, what thickness of hail to work with um, so we went looking as much as we could and we used the bureau of meteorology to to go back 50 years to see uh, what Type of hail was 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 um, was experienced in Parramatta and the surrounding areas, and all we really got from that process was the size of the hail rather than the depth, like it would a rainfall amount. So, and and more specifically on the stadium itself, because of the undersung fabric and the shape of it, there is fifty six uh, sumps, rainfall sumps around the roof, um, on located on the grids. So, we knew that if there was any type of blockage at any point in time, that 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 sump might block, um, and the roof might have to hold more water than was expected. So there was there was over three stages of um, processes we went through. Each sump itself has a primary siphonic outlet, and then there's a secondary siphonic outlet in case the first one gets blocked. If the second one gets blocked, then we also have overflow spitters of the sumps located quite high. So there are a couple of two, uh, 150 millimetre diameter pipes that can outlet water from the sump. And if they were blocked, we were able to analyse the roof and see if it could handle, say, a 25 year rainfall event, which is a serviceability event. And what we found is in that case, the, the roof could hold a lot of water, much more than the sump itself. And there could be up to 10 cubic meters, so 10 tons of water per sump, that the structure would not fail under that instance. So if you consider around the roof, because each section is um, or each truss is very individual and independent, 
you could have 500 tons of water on the roof and it wouldn't fail. So it's a very robust structure. Um, and that was a, it sort of worked with the type of structure that we had. So we didn't really need to add any more steel to address that. That was just something that came up through the design. So we feel that's a pretty robust solution to a loading requirement, which isn't really defined clearly, um, but we know has effects and we have seen the consequences of those in the past. Thanks, Joe. Um, over to you, Spiros. We've had a great question coming from Albert. Uh, good afternoon, asking, material-wise, is there any innovation of the raw material, the steelmaking process, in light of reducing greenhouse gases? Thank you, Albert. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, look, uh, that, that's a, uh, an entirely topic on itself on sustainability and uh, yeah, Blue Scope, I actually have got a lot of programs uh, on and um, we do have, uh, we do intend to have a presentation on sustainability uh, next year. But in fairly short, um, we pretty much, uh, Blue Scope is skipping up with a 2030 uh, Paris Agreement in uh, with the uh, reduced uh, gas uh, emissions. Um, and um, and we're also um, in line with receiving a um, um, a, a, um, a, um, a certificate by um, uh, the, the end of um, uh, or, or by the end of the year on a responsible steel. Um, so um, there's a lot of programs on, and um, hopefully um, um, this there'll be a lot more coming next year. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. We're looking forward to that one. Um, question for you, Richard, uh, around the foundation system for the stadium. The question is, what is the foundation system for the stadium? Was material in the building founded on and, and were there any issues coming out of the ground? Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so there was a significant um, excavation phase for the, for the site. Um, some remediation work and obviously the reshaping of the uh, site to suit the new footprint. Um, we uh, took, there was about 450 piles that went into the ground, a mixture of CFA and board piles. They ranged in depth from, uh, from 10 metres up to 16 metres in depth to be socketed into rock. Uh, so that, that was really the, the core of the, the, the structural foundation for the building. Um, we used uh, quite a bit of the, the site uh, fill material to create the um, profile for the concourse, um, from which we then had um, our, concor our concourse slab, concrete slab, uh, designed as a suspended slab on that um, level. Um, now, there was quite a lot of in-ground services through that concourse to um, accommodate for the food and beverage outlets, um, and that was probably one of the most challenges getting out of the ground. Um, obviously from the, the trenching work required to install all the new uh, hydraulic and sewer services. So, um, yeah, as always, the challenge is getting out of the ground with um, exposed to the weather elements. Um, but once we had that concrete foundation to work off, um, we could get on with the um, bowl, bowl and um, uh, raker construction. Thanks. Thanks for that, Richard. Um, well, we've had a question come in from Dennis. Over to you, Joe, asking, have you done installation sequence analysis? And if so, uh, what is the sequence? Well, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, the beauty of the installation sequence is that it was so flexible in the way uh, the bowl and, and roof and roof trusses and pre-assembled bays were installed. So um, the whole point was to, to make it flexible. And as I did discussed, each each bay was lifted into position, but the sequence required. So it didn't matter whether bay 56 or bay 25 went in. Um, at, at any point in time, it was completely flexible. So that was the beauty of it. Thanks, Joe. And just stay with you. A question coming. Good afternoon, Chris. Asking, how did you get around the torsion issues? on the open sections when installing the plats on the rakers? Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, I think that question is uh, referring to when you might be loading one side of an open section being the raker with precast plats and not the next. So we went through a process to analyze that open section with torsion. Like, Obviously, an open section doesn't have great torsion 
resistance, uh, but there was some support from incoming bracing members, which did assist in increasing that capacity. But uh, we found we got to the point where there wasn't really any restrictions on um, being able to install one bay of precast plats before the adjacent bay went in. We thought initially it might have been up to around 10 precast plats before you needed to start the next bay, but we were able to refine that and that was extended right out so that a full bay could be completed before moving on. And that also helped Lend Lease install a sequence without having to swap and change and move the crane between positions to install plats. Thanks for that, Joe. And just staying with you and moving on to the technology, we've had a question come in from Smeet who's asking, was a special analysis software uh, like Inductor adopted for analysis and design of the connections? Thanks, Joe. Uh, there was a couple of um, software packages used, but I, I think, you know, to look a little bit deeper into that, the beauty of a bolted connection uh, compared to a welded connection is that you have a really defined load path. So we were able to, at any point in time, simple checks were able, were, were able to be undertaken. And um, that really defined, we, we could see where the load was going through the connection compared to say a welded connection where you get a lot more spread. Um, so we were able to refine the elements because we're going through the section. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard, um, Chris has sent through a question um, asking, and I think you talked about it a little in your presentation, but just remind us, how, how did you deal with rainwater runoff, given the plat joint is directly above the rake, as typically you would provide a small gutter such, section within the structural member? Um, Richard. Um, so yeah, to answer that question, um, I guess the the roof um, coverage um, is over the entire seating um, of the stadium. Uh, where we had the precast uh, plats uh, sitting on the rakers, the steel rakers, um, that, at that joint location, that was um, fully corked uh, from the top surface. So that would provide a, um, I guess, a weather tight seal, so water would not drain in between the, the two precast elements um, onto that steel raker. Uh, so yeah, so from uh, from a rain coverage um, for the upper bowl in particular, um, that you, you do have the full full coverage uh, from the roof as well. So hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, we've had a question uh, from Jaron, uh, Joe, asking, did you find that the labour behind connecting members via pure pure bolted connections compared to welded sections was a longer process? during installation? Yeah, we did, we did look at it, but I think if you, the only way to really consider that is when you look at a, a fully welded connection or the bolted alternative. And if you consider the full process of the amount of work that goes into welding and the testing requirements as well, you find that um, those connections are very specific when they're welded and they're unique and um, compared to uh, the efficiencies in the design that we were able to undertake. Where I mentioned earlier, we were able to separate the stools from the raker and they were able to be packaged up, processed and fabricated in bulk rather than moving from connection to connection on a, on a welded element. So overall, we thought there were still efficiencies and it did not only that, um, but it kept a lot of the fabrication away from site. And we all know that working on site um, Richard mentioned that um, you can't control the rain, so there's a lot of um, influences on site that slow down, slow you down during that during that installation and assembly process, and that was really a benefit because we were able to remove that uh, risk from the process. So that's another consideration that needs to be thought about uh, when you're looking at the overall efficiencies. Thanks, Joe. And thank you to everyone for sending in um, so many questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, just staying with you, Joe. a great question is coming from Peter asking, what are the fundamental reasons as to why open sections are less efficient than closed sections in a structure like this? Thanks, Joe. If you, if you look at the, um, the, the, the way the structure behaves, especially in the, the cantilevered systems, um, closed sections, say like a circular hollow section or a square hollow section, 
are much more efficient to withstand compression. And that's typically what a truss system does. Um, open sections are more akin to, say, um, resisting bending, say, in a, as a floor element, um, and something that provides lateral restraint to the element. Um, so that's the real difference between the, uh, an open section and a closed section. So there was probably a difference of maybe 10 to 20% in efficiencies, but we were able to overcome that through to uh, by this uh, beamline strategies and our connection approach. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. And Richard, um, we've had a question coming from Bogdan around fire requirements, asking you, what were the fire requirements for this structure and how were they addressed in design fabrication processes? Richard? I'm sorry, Amanda, so I didn't quite uh, catch that. Question. Oh, that's okay. So um, Bogdan sent her a question, which is a great one around fire requirements for this structure. Uh, what were they and how were they addressed in the design stroke fabrication processes? Is that something you can answer or um, maybe we should talk? Sorry, we could, we've got Sorry I think I've got a question. bad connection there, Amanda. I didn't hear the question. Yeah, oh, that's okay. Um, are you okay to go? Maybe we'll go to um, back to you, Joe. Um, we've had a question come in about um, steel tonnage, and maybe Spiros might want to jump in here, asking how much additional steel tonnage is required in additional plates to avoid welding during fabrication of the main members. And that's coming from Cameron. Good afternoon. Joe. I can answer that one. If if you need to, Amanda. Got a bad connection. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was probably between ten and twenty percent to look at that. But um, uh, I also mentioned in the previous answer that even though there was an increase in weight, the processing techniques through our assembly installation and fabrication was was able to offset that. So I would have expected something in the order of fifteen percent on average on some of those members. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a couple of questions around the drawings. And Joe, a uh, question that's coming from Sam, Sam B, asking, how did changes to fab drawings impact connection plates from already fabbed and delivered on site, i.e. modify or scrap? Joe. Well, the beauty of the process we went through is that we had less than a dozen um, instances where that information needed to be amended on shop drawings. So all those all those questions or, or um, problems that revolve around a late um, shop drawing review in terms of the fabrication might have already started before the, sh the shop drawings were approved wasn't the case on this project uh, because we were sitting alongside the shop drawers during the entire process, we were able to answer those questions before it actually happened. And if there was any instances where a plate needed to be amended, it might have been a fabrication error, which was few and far between. So it wasn't anything that I, I can't even remember an example where that happens. So large project with lots of steel, it, it does happen, um, but this one it didn't. And that was just due to the process we undertook. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And Richard, how's is, is your connection back working? Yeah. Um, I might just um, go over to Spiros and ask a question because it's something that I'm conscious of time. Um, I just wanted to ask with, um, with, as I say, the Olympics at Brisbane, congratulations, one in 2013. Uh, sorry, it's coming in and out. Um, it's coming in and out. Spiros, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, I can. Okay. I just wondered, you know, with the Olympics not far away, et cetera, um, from a steel perspective, um, what, what sort of trends and innovations do you sort of see coming in in your, in your sector, in the industry? Oh, look, um... Um, we would um, like to be working closely with the um, uh, 
specifiers, um, architects and, um, and structural engineers um, and see how we could um, really um, add value in the early phase of their designs um, using as much um, as mentioned earlier, off-site uh, prefabrication and um, uh, the beamline uh, techniques, which uh, um, even though at times it may you may add up um, a little bit more mass of steel, but um, compared to saving the labour component, um, the, the benefits are, are just uh, a, a lot greater from a lot of uh, yeah, perspectives. Thanks, Spiros. And Joe, um, hopefully um, you can hear me okay? I Joe? can. Yeah, great. We've had a question coming from uh, Tasmania from Suprajit asking, were there any important influencing factors for grid spacing or column spacing in the upper bowl? Thank you. That's a good question. On the north, south and east, the, the, the 10.2 metre grid that we used was fundamentally around either the width of each of the bays and the, the amount of seats that you're allowed to have in one particular bay. And it also was influenced by the size of each of the precast plats. And it went back to logistics and, and craneage and what size cranes we needed to, to lift into position. Um, in the Western stand, it's a little different. The 15.3 metre grid is usually a uh, a multiple of a 7.65 metre grid and that's that's really based around the function rooms and the suites that are the, the function suites and the and um, uh, the corporate areas the corporate suites that are required to be to be fit out so it's usually a double a, either a 7.65 a double that at 15.3 or one and a half and we chose 15.3 because combined with the type of construction we were using in the floor systems as being uh, in situ post tension concrete that really worked and we got we got efficiencies out of uh, that span and that's why it worked well with a larger grid spacing. Thanks Joe. Just staying with you um, we've had a question that's come in from Amaranath asking in terms of sustainability this stadium, uh, what measures were incorporated in terms of solar panels, installation, battery storage, rainwater water storage, harvesting, etc. So if you can try and sort of sum that up pretty quickly, that would be great. Uh, just specifically around the solar panels, there isn't there isn't batteries uh, batteries in place to to um, store that energy, but on game days and during the day, there is some usage that does fulfil that requirement. And, and that energy is used. Um, rainwater harvesting uh, occurs on site, so there's four main tanks, and all the water all the water that's harvested is is reused um, on the pitch. That's part of that process. So there's a couple of initiatives uh, that we did undertake. It should be noted that um, we had to work hard to try and make the roof efficient on the west, because as you can imagine, um, on normal solar installations on houses, they install straight on a roof. Um, they either have roof sheeting or roof tiles, but in this in this instance, because our roof was a fabric and was underslung, we had to create a, a frame system for those solar panels. And it wasn't necessarily just the solar panels; it was more the access platforms that was required to access uh, and maintain those solar panels over its design life. So it was a challenge to make it efficient. Um, but there was a discrete and specific layout of those panels to minimise the amount of access walkways we needed to provide full coverage across the panels themselves. Thanks, Joe. Um, we've had a few questions about the future, and I say for stadiums with the Olympics coming here to Australia. Again, obviously, a lot of people are thinking about this. We had a question that came in from Janard and asking, you know, do you think in the future that we're expecting a stadium with a mobile roof cover as and when required during adverse weather conditions? And that was for you, Joe. But just to all our speakers, um, as we move into um, towards 2032, um, what do you see is going to be the main trends um, in stadium design and and construction going going forward. Uh, Joe, if you could just ask the one about the mobile roof as a start off. Yeah, definitely. So 
having a, a, a closable roof is something that's very specific and um, it's really driven around um, if there is an economic need to it. So there's particular events that would need that. And in the instance of Bank West, based on, um, you know, it was something that was considered very early on and I'm assuming it was considered very early in the, the planning feasibility before Lendlease bid the project itself. Um, I think what it's really important is, is having market sounding into that process and understanding who will be using the stadium and if they require a roof. Now, a closing roof does add additional cost to the overall project. It can be significant because not only do you need to install an entire roof, but you also need to strengthen or design the new stadium, the fixed parts of the roof to support the moving parts. So it, it does have a knock-on effect and that works its way all the way down through the columns into the pile and they'll all be affected by that increased load. So uh, it's it's something that uh, having a closable roof is is and having it being able to be opened is very important too because as I mentioned earlier, the, the first 10 metres around the stadium, uh, stadium roof, the leading edge is a clear ETFE and that's really important to maintain pitch growth. So if you had a, um, um, a roof that was constant, constantly closed, you wouldn't get that pitch growth. So you need, you need sunlight, you need, you need ventilation. So it comes down to whether it's economically viable and would that stadium be used enough in those particular instances to, to really justify that roof being needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. And Richard, just really quickly, you touched on what you'd do differently uh, about Bankwest Stadium, but going forward from a constructor point of view, what do you think will be the main trends? Um, I think probably moving into the future, the main trend will be uh, the material availability and uh, speed that you can procure that material with the amount of construction going on in the industry at this point in time. Um, obviously, our footprint and from a sustainability, um, what we build in the future and 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 its uh, use and adaptability in particular, you know, with, with with stadiums and being adaptable to multiple codes, so you can maximise the use um, of a stadium in a particular area. So I think it's working through those challenges to optimise the usage out of our stadiums, um, so as that you get um, best value for for the build. Spiros. Do you want to add anything to that before we close off? Sorry, um, no, I, th I think uh, both speakers, speakers uh, covered that pretty well. Um, so um, we're here to support, as I mentioned earlier, and um, um, yeah, just get, get, get us involved uh, early in the piece to, to assist with the um, uh, supply and um, any efficiencies that comes with it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Spiros. And it is all we have time for again today. Thank you for all the questions that came through. Um, we will be uh, having future uh, webinars with Blue Scope. Um, so once again, please join me in thanking Joseph Perello, Richard Yarrard and Spiros Dallas for their time and insights shared at today's session. I'd also like to warmly thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Blue Scope, for making this webinar possible. As always, we'd appreciate feedback on the program today to help us improve and plan for future sessions. So please, if you could take a couple of minutes to complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. On behalf of Engineers Australia, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Good afternoon. <laughs>